I'm Natalie Redding of Namaste Farms and I teach dyeing and I teach about uh, fleece and fiber literally all over the world. I also broker wool. Um, I think my main gig really is uh, um, teaching dyeing and a, uh, a dyeing methodology that I created called Redding Method and you can find that at readingmethod.com and I also have the website namastefarms.com and woolshampoo.com. Most people, if you buy fleece, they'll say things like, oh, I have a bunch of fleeces, but I have to get to skirting them. I skirt mine on the on that on the um, on my platform. Since I'm new to this, what does skirting mean? Skirting is like removing all of the belly wool, the leg wool, okay. anything that's not good. Gotcha. And for me, because I don't sell my fleeces by the fleece, I sell them by the pound. I remove anything that doesn't look the same. Okay, so what doesn't look the same? In a merino or a fine wool sheep, they've been selectively bred for so long that the neck and the bridge wool, so if you're right here, it's right mm -hmm. here in the bridge, is you can't tell the difference. So if you show me a long wool, and like a fleece on the ground, I can tell you where what part came from where because it's really easily identified, especially by the bridge and by the neck because the neck usually kind of opens a little bit and the bridge usually has hair in it, medulated fiber. So, so, that, so it's straight instead of having this evenness of curl it'll end up being a lot straighter. Something like this you can tell is from the neck. See how it's like Shirley Temple? Okay. Okay, see the Shirley Temple, the way the locks are? That's from hanging down here and it's able to have the freedom to turn. Gotcha. Here, like you can see it didn't have the freedom to turn because it was like against, it doesn't have the freedom to. So this is bridge? No, no, this okay. is like this is like maybe on the shoulder okay. because it's attached, attached in here. But, but only the neck wool can do this because there's nothing for it to hit as the animal's walking. It's just spiraling like this as opposed to, did you see? Gotcha. Yeah. So on it, but on a merino, this doesn't happen because they have a very, this isn't merino. Actually, this is merino right here. This is what I have. This is merino. Okay. You have probably Coriadale from me. Okay. So this is merino and see how it's got a blunt tip and it doesn't hang freely like this. Gotcha. It's dense. Okay. The finer the wool, the denser the fiber. Okay. That's just a scientific fact. So this wouldn't do that. And a really good merinos and really good fine wool sheep like a merino, you can't tell the difference between the neck wool and the bridge. Okay. My breeds you can totally. So I remove things like the bridge and the neck when it doesn't look the same. So this doesn't look the same, but it's still completely acceptable. Those ringlets, this is completely acceptable to put into somebody's, um, to, into their... Scrap box? No, or the scrap box fiber is different. Okay. So what I do on the blanket, when the blankets are on them, the jackets, and the jackets are made like, they have to breathe, they have to let, they have to let the, the rain in and they have to be able to dry. Mm -hmm. People think that they're hot, but they're just like windbreakers. Okay. There's parts sticking out of the blanket. Scrap boxes are all the stuff sticking out of the blanket. Because since I sell by the pound and everything has to look the same, if it's under the blanket, which is what I sell, uh -huh. anything by the pound is under the blanket. Okay. Scrap, box, scrap boxes are still really good fiber, but it's just stuff that is out of the, And when you wash it, you would never even know. But because it's a visual thing and my customer base don't want to sell it to somebody who's more like me that has to see how good it can be and I don't want them to be disappointed when they open it because they expect good fiber from me however not everything in the mine is expensive what I do a lot of the time is all this because I get so much that's with the outside of the blanket what I'll do is I sell that I call it dregs because dregs literally means like stuff that you don't want right so um, I'll have so much of it that I sell like the giant they're, they're huge like there's these um these flat rate boxes full full of dregs and I mean I stuff as much I mean I compress it and I stuff as much as I can in here and I sell that to people and and it's people that you know know that it doesn't it's not going to be perfect it's going to be a bunch of different breeds but that they want it for cheaper and um and it's really cheap and um then they just make it beautiful they make it amazing mm -hmm.
Okay. Okay. So I'm just gonna show you like this is something that I that I that I shared and it's a it's, this is a first first lamp lease. And so how do I know that? Um, yeah. Well, I can. Uh, there's a couple of ways that I know it. Um, first of all, it has these tiny little. See this tiny little tip? That tiny little okay. thing here. Yeah. See that tiny little tip, how tiny, it's thin. And it looks like it goes, it's like a little tiny curly curly. We right. call it purling. So on the end, that's how I know. That's how I know that it's- So that's it's, brick? No, 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 That this has never been shorn before. It's a oh, place. gotcha. So, and then it, it's the, you know, the crimp is, okay, so this is somewhere, this is like on the shoulder, on the back. Here is the bridge. Ah, uh, See? Yeah. There's no way you cannot tell. When you know, you know. Here, this is the bridge. So the bridge, you see how it's got the straight fibers in it? Yeah. So this I would pull out. And I would, this would, this could end up in a scrap box. It depends on how soft it is compared to the rest. Okay. Um, and, but that's how long wools are. This is not because this is a bad sheep. Long wools, this is just characteristic of them because we haven't selectively bred them for, um, for fleece. This would be the neck. Okay. And um, bridge and neck. So you see it just looks different. One is really, really, really see how straight that is yes. it doesn't look like the rest and so this wouldn't be included in if you bought wool for me like the, the wool I would only put something like this in it okay and then this would be in a scrap box and if this wasn't you know terribly modulated this would be in scrap boxes and um, the people would get the good stuff Beautiful. yeah so, and so for the scrap boxes what I do is I it's usually stuff that's left over and I decide essentially based on what the use is going to be for. So you don't usually make something um, softer. So if I have a high micron uh, a fleece that's like a Wensleydale Ortiz water, which is relatively high micron, but has luster like no other. If I put Merino in with it that's super fine, it's not going to make this softer. It's going to make the Merino coarser feeling. And long wools, while they are coarser, it doesn't mean that you it's, that they're like like uh, Brillo pads. It just they're a higher micron. But as you get a higher micron, you get more luster. You can't have that in a merino. Merino has no luster. It's very matte, and it's the equivalent of like matte paint versus high gloss paint. So the way that I match them is sort of like and like. Every once in a while, I'll throw like a Coriadale, which is a medium wool, has a little bit. Um, it is like a 20, around 23 to 25 micron. It has more characteristics of a merino, um, it ha but it has a longer staple um, and it has a wider, more bold crimp. So this is this is a quarry. And I'll put that in there and that's because I have quarries and I love quarries and um, I just like it, but it will be matte in comparison. And so and it has more surface area, so it'll pick up more dye It'll take more dye, but it just won't look as brilliant. But I just throw it in because it makes it, I just, it's just different and I like it. It's, if I want looking for something soft, like I would do an, an alpaca and like a merino blend and maybe throw some cori in there. And if I'm doing long wool blend, I'll usually use like something like this right here. You can tell, see how wide the lock is here as opposed to like here. So do you see how, do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. This means this is a cross. This is a long wool cross. So it's crossed with something else. This is a pure. This is a pure, like a, a Wednesday Del Tees water. Wednesday Dells and Tees waters are almost identical. The fleeces are almost identical. There are no black Tees waters though. That's the difference. So anyway, I would, if I'm gonna do like a long wool, cause you kind of want a similar staple length, that helps and a similar micron. So I would put, you know, I can put all these together. And then um, once I, you know, have a bag full of it, full of whatever, and believe me, I have many, many, many bags, <laughs> but I'll just grab one and then I'll go straight to the dye pot, which is what we'll do now. And then we start scratching. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Do I need to reach over and pet you? Do I need to pet you? Yes. Yes. Here, I'll put my coffee. Yeah. I just have to go grab some um, shampoo to play ball right there. Okay, okay. this is this for, Sorry. Yep. Okay. Okay. So what I do is this is where I'll put like things immediately when I'm skirting my animals as I'm 
as I'm um, shearing, like afterwards. And this is like, you can tell, this, see, this just doesn't look very pretty, but I promise you, this is like outside of the blanket. Once it's um, dyed, it'll be amazing. You would never know. So I go through and I just kind of decide what parts I want because sometimes I throw stuff in here that I shouldn't have. And, you know, I'll just pick through it and I throw it in a giant pot like this one. And I pay attention to what kind of fleece. If I was to have something in here that was high felting, higher micron, usually, if, and especially if it's not double coated, and these are double coated animals, they are very heat tolerant. This is stuff from the UK. It's very long and beautiful, but this is stuff that I wouldn't sell unless it had been washed because they don't coat their animals. And this has been on the animal for a year. But because I dye my wool dirty and in shampoo, we have a special product that we had made because my, my husband comes from a hair care family. Um, Jerry Redding was his father that created Nexus and Jeremac and um, Redken. We have this product that was specifically made so that you can dye in it and it also is a dye booster. So what I'll do is I'll fill this and then I put the shampoo and the thing is is the, the, the um, melting point of lanolin is like 38 um, degrees so it's very, it's um, actually quite a low melting point and that means that People will think that you can't dye stuff dirty, which is ridiculous, because if it's liquid, basically at room temperature, when you're at 200 degrees, it's definitely going to be, you know, melted and it's going to come off. So the only issue ever is if it's got so much dirt on, on it that the dye actually can't penetrate inside. Like, so tippy stuff that has like a lot of dirt on it, like this may or may not come off. But if it does come off, it's gonna be amazing. If it doesn't come off, I just throw it out. So it took a little bit of dye. But I usually, because I'll sell so many strap boxes, it'll be probably two of these full. So once I do, so I'll fill this up to about here. I put the shampoo in it, I'm pretty generous with it. And the thing that's great about that is that there's no reason to, most people don't die unless their stuff is clean, which is ridiculous because why would you go through all that when you're gonna have to wash it to get all the residual dye out anyway? So it's saving, it's saving you money, it's saving you time, saving you water, and in California we have a water shortage. So people don't realize that uh, wool can actually handle being boiled. What it can't handle is rapid changes of temperature. That's what it can't handle. So, I mean, you couldn't boil like an ultra fine merino for, for very long, but I've boiled long wools for like hours. I've forgotten about it because I was shearing or something and I've come back and I've evaporated most of the water and the long wool's fine. So I get it before I ever put dye in it really hot, exceptionally hot because that's the way the dyes work. They need to have heat. I'll put, you have to put a, um, a fixative in here um, to make the dyes work because these work with a weak acid. So acetic acid, so vinegar, or citric acid. A lot of people prefer citric acid. I actually prefer vinegar, white vinegar. Why? Because it's cheaper. And I don't have to have it shipped. I can just go to Walmart or whatever and buy it and it's like $2. Maybe $3 for one of these. You're like, I'm not sure because actually my husband gets it for me there. So I will put the vinegar in here and then once it's hot, then I'll start dyeing. Because I like super saturated colors, I use dry, dry dye. And so what, what, what do you mean dry dye? I use dye that is not reconstituted. So this is for something else. This is not for, dry, for dyeing um, my fiber. Um, and the reason why I don't like to use stuff that's reconstituted is that I am increasing the immersion and the more immersion you have and the more liquid you have in there, the less you can control your dyes and they're just going to migrate everywhere and then you're going to have a muddy mess. So I have a whole, um, I have an entire methodology called Reading Method that I created and it's all about dyeing and understanding how to dye and the thing that's great about it is in the end it gives you consistency and it saves you money in the long run. It really does because instead of having filled pots, filled pots, filled pots, or a pot you love and you can't redo again, 
you understand what you can do to control because everything in this is about control. Learning how to, con and I am not a controlling person, but when it comes to dying, I'm a control freak. So once, once I've dyed it, it's finished. Um, a lot of people think that your water should be clear, and I will tell you right now, that's simply not true. Um, if, you, if your water is clear after you've dyed, you probably did not saturate. And the only way to know whether or not you've saturated is to slightly oversaturate. And a lot of people don't understand this. And that's why I can sell a lot of products, because my stuff will look as vibrant as the stuff on the, that's not drying over there, or even like this. I saturate fully, and the only way to saturate fully is to slightly oversaturate. But that doesn't mean you're not going to be color fast. The thing that's amazing about this is that you see how there's yellow, that's, and there's purple here. Having yellow next to purple is a very difficult thing to do and not have mud. Yellow and purple are, they are, they're opposing and, and as far as the color will, and they do not like each other and so they normally will make mud. This is actually a brilliant piece of work and it was done in the kettle and it's because I can control my dyes. So once this pot is finished, what I will do is I let it sit normally. I let it sit and to, because that like lets all of the dye that can possibly strike, strike and then I will dump it. And once I dump it and let it cool, I spin out everything, all of the dirt and all of the residual dye. So dye, the dye that you will see come out of this is unbelievable. You, it looks like, oh my gosh, that will never be color fast. But that's because I know what I'm doing and I know I, how much dye each type of fiber can tolerate. These are spin dryers and I have one for swimsuits and this one is like, an, it's called a Nina, I think, and you can buy it on Amazon. But my mom used to say, why, why bathe? because you're bathing in dirty water and it's sort of the same thing. If you don't get all of the dirt out and all of the residual dye out, you're just gonna be rinsing ad nauseum to try to get it out. So after I spin it out, I will I'll rinse it um, and I'll put some shampoo in it with hot water and then I'll put it back in there. I usually only have to do one more rinse after that. So it's like one wash, one rinse, and then I'm done. And then I take it over to my dry racks. Okay. So here, this it was already, this was washed. I dyed it yesterday. And this is the dry rack. This is two of those giant pots full. And it doesn't look very impressive now because it require, when things are wet, they don't reflect light. And so this is a, near as pretty as it will be. When it's dry, it will be amazing. And you can see here, like there's some iridescence that's starting to come in. It's gonna be beautiful. It's a beautiful colorway. I literally, so this is one scrap box. This is a scrap box. And um, it'll probably, in the California sun here, I'm imagining it'll be dry by the end of the day. And once I do this, um, and it's completely dry, I'll take components of it and I'll look at the colorway as a whole and then I'll go back into the studio and I'll decide what kind of threads, what kind of silk, um, what kind of ribbon, um, or, or any kind of add-ins really go with this. And then I make this thing called a scrap box. It's named after my dog Scrappy. And um, it's like a whole compilation of different types of materials and fibers so that you can make an art yarn. Sometimes there are ones that you can make like a traditional type of yarn. And even with these things, you can make a traditional type of yarn. The problem is, is if you card things that are super colorful too much, you make dryer lint and it looks terrible. It breaks my heart too. Someone will send me a picture of something that they've carded way too much and it breaks, it literally breaks my heart that they've ruined this beautiful fiber and made it homogenized. But anyway, that's, that's the story of, of a scrap box. Okay, so besides the scrap boxes, one of the things that I do is I teach a lot and um, I like the idea of empowering people because it does save them a tremendous amount of time and money. But it's also great to be able to make things yourself and things that are super marketable. Um, I have a class called Nabori that is dying with silk. And so this is actually made with like leftover dye. And I just tied it in a, I tied it in a, in a sort of a, a shibori way, which is a Japanese type of dyeing, which normally isn't on silk, and was able to get these colors. And having 
the experience and being able to teach the way to use these dies makes it so almost everything turns out amazing. So here's, this is one of my favorite ones I wear all the time. And then um, here's one that's not so organic looking. And it's sort of more in the tradition of a tie dye, like a traditional tie dye um, in a silk charm mousse. And then this kind of stuff I love because this, these were all white ones. And here's another one. This is with fiber reactive dyes. But when I look at them, you can see almost faces in them. And it's a pattern. It looks like an actual fabric. And it started out just as a white piece of silk. And so my whole thing is being able to empower people and um, help them control the way that they create their art. And for people, it's very fulfilling. It really is because nobody wants to feel out of control or like they can't do something. And dying is often elusive, but once you understand the principles, and so that's my whole thing is just teaching people how to understand the principles so that they can be successful. So one of the things when you're having a business is obviously you have to have a multitude of things uh, to sell because you don't, if you have one thing, then it's like having all your eggs in one basket. And not everybody likes the same thing. So I teach dyeing on cellulose fibers. And so here's a bag that is using the same principles um, of reading method to create on a cellulose fiber um, art. And we do this by tying and binding and then using um, certain dyes and dye color combinations. And then I do things like put copper rivets in it. And eventually this will probably have like turquoise beads on it. And then you can do things like dyeing on silk. And this is more of a traditional type shibori type of look where it's very organic. organic. Or you can do things like learn how to dye fleece and empower yourself that way. And you can use it for making weavings or hand spinning into art yarn. Um, also, you can do things like ha make humane pelts. So this is not a pelt from an animal that's been skinned. Um, it's actually was removed from an animal that had wool break. And then I dyed the entire piece. And it's actually pretty amazing. And these you can use for chair covers or you can stabilize them and you can put them into the perfect shape of the animal. It's pretty close, but it's one of the things that's really popular. Um, I call them partially cotted boas and this is also a partially cotted boa and I make a lot of revenue off of those. So it's really about diversifying and empowering yourself with education and understanding what you're doing. And in the long run, you can make things and make money or just make things for yourself and your family. And still, you can end up saving money. <laughs>